Zhao. Okay, the next part is our contribution part. So in this part, we in this slide we have six presentations from both IQR 2023 papers and our contributions to our workshop. Like we have more than 30 submissions and we have accepted 14 contributions. So we we will introduce our next speaker who is. Uh, Dr. Profil, and he will discuss the Acura 2023 papers, which is a oral paper, I think. Yeah, neural ground plans persistent neural scene representations from a single image. That's welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Profil. I'm a PhD student, so not yet a doctor. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the computer vision and graphics group at MIT, and I'm uh, co-advised by Professor Bill Freeman and Fredo Durand. And today I'll be presenting our work on neural ground lens, uh, which was accepted at this conference. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with uh, collaborators at MIT CSAIL and uh, Toyota Research Institute. So when we look at this image, what do we see? Uh, we can roughly imagine the 3D objects for each object in the scene, and we also know which objects can move and which cannot move. But where is this belief coming from? It comes from having seen these objects in 3D, uh, and this is the prior that we have learned. And by seeing some objects move in videos, so over time we accumulate this prior about the 3D geometry and what objects move or do not move. Furthermore, uh, I would like to note that it is important that uh, even though objects live in 3D, most objects are moving in 2D, especially in an autonomous driving setup, such as cars, uh, and also in like tabletop robotic setup. Uh, so effectively, we want to learn a persistent representation in a self-supervised manner, uh, which can be learned using videos from different uh, viewpoints of a scene with moving objects. So just to formalize the goal of this project, uh, at test time we want the method to take in a single image of the scene, come up with a r representation which is persistent not in the uh, parameters of the neural network but there's like a discrete grid which is aligned to the ground uh, that is the scene representation, and it can be used for multiple downstream tasks, such as null view synthesis, static dynamic disentanglement, localization, uh, scene editing, and object level representation. So just as an example, here given a single input image, our method outputs 360 views of the scene. It can uh, render out the static part separately, the object part separately, and now, uh, using the bird's eye view, we can localize all these objects, come up with instance level segmentations, bounding boxes. Uh, then further, w once you get the bounding boxes, we can do scene editing and get uh, individual object level slots. So due to lack of like a multi-view data set that has like wide baselines, which is a requirement to learn enough 3D and also disentangle in at the same time, uh, we generated a synthetic data set uh, of moving cars. So our training uh, data set comprises of 8,000 scenes, uh, and this is basically rendered using like 15 city configurations that we got using City Engine, which is generally used in architecture department for city design. Uh, once we get the city design, we populate the assets in Blender, uh, this work was mostly done as part of a previous master's thesis at MIT by uh, student Nishal Bhandari. Uh, furthermore, we added like dynamics and parallel multi-view rendering, uh, and we can also get like relative camera poses. Uh, this data set will be provided on our website. So firstly, I'll describe inference of a ground plan for a given image. So once you have an image, uh, we basically get, we pass the image through a pre-trained ResNet 34. You can use any um, like encoder uh, and extract the intermediate activations. These uh, features are then unprojected along the camera depth, um, along with the camera depth like the Z buffer at each point into the feature uh, using a trainable MLP. Um, since we need to deal with like unbounded outdoor scenes, um, we use the idea 
of contracted space presented by Baron and colleagues uh, in MIPNERF 360. Uh, so in this idea, basically, uh, at the center, you see the camera. And the blue uh, disk around the camera is using uh, linear coordinates. And beyond that, all, all the points until infinity are remapped uh, based on disparity uh, in this yellow grid right here. And this basically en ensures that uh, you are not doing like infinite number of samples when you are doing any uh, rendering. So this unprojection step leads to 3D volume of depth encoded features. And you can just directly operate on this uh, 3D volume, uh, but this would be very expensive because either you would be using like a 3D CNN, which is very costly, or if you want to do uh, 3D attention, then good luck uh, fitting that model. So uh, to be more efficient, we add a pillar aggregation module, which implicitly aggregates the feature along the height. So each of these features is concatenated with the height passed through the MLP, and you get a particular score for each of the features, uh, which is the alpha i, and that is used to do the weighted sum to give you a single latent on the ground plan. So this results in a grid of features that is aligned with the ground plan. Uh, each feature is basically describing uh, like the color and the density along the height. Um, in case of like multiple views, we basically average the ground plans at this point, and the ground plan is now passed through a 2D CNN to extract like static ground plan and uh, dynamic ground plan. And this is basically done as, okay, you can say like, what is this 2D CNN learning? So I'm now going to describe where is the signal coming from, and what do we use to train the static and the dynamic ground plan? So during training, we get like two temporal frames from multiple viewpoints along with their relative camera poses. And we also know uh, where the ground plane is. Uh, so relatively, the angle of the camera is known along the altitude, uh, in the altitude azimuth uh, format. So as, as I discussed, for each of the images, we can get uh, the static and the dynamic ground plan. Uh, for each time step, uh, we get like a particular static and a particular dynamic ground plan. We pull the static ground plan and we keep the dynamic ground plan for each of the time steps. Um, together, these are composed uh, using a NERF like MLP rendering module, where basically for each 3D point, you project it down on the plane, uh, on the ground plan. You extract that latent, concatenate that with the height. Uh, of that point, and you get a density and a color which can be composed together. So the only task we are training on is null view synthesis. Um, so that's the reconstruction loss term. And we add a dynamic sparsity loss on the dynamic ground plans. So that is basically saying that the densities expressed by the dynamic ground plan has to be sparse. And that is actually the crucial point which uh, enforces this disentanglement uh, because otherwise the ground plans, uh, the dynamic ground plans express the scene itself um, and does not lead to disentanglement. So the entire loss term is basically the image reconstruction loss where we add LPIPs once we reach like a PSNR of 15 or 16. Uh, and there's the dynamic sparsity loss and there's a surface, a hard uh, surface loss which basically says that each 3D point should have a density close to zero or one. So in terms of results, given an input image, now we can compose and we can uh, render the scene in a 360, uh, 360 view. We can just render the static ground plan and the dynamic ground plan to get the static and the dynamic components individually. Now the interesting part is, once you have the dynamic ground plan, uh, you can basically render the orthographic projection from the top and only render out the densities. Once you have those, uh, you can run like a connected component detector, which basically gives you the 2D um, bounding box around the object. And for the height, you basically compute which is the highest point with a positive density. 
and that gives you the bounding boxes. And if you overwrite the color in these bounding boxes expressed by the dynamic ground plans, you can get the instance level segmentation, uh, which is 3D consistent. Um, once you have the bounding boxes, if you isolate each of the objects in the bounding boxes, you get object slots. Um, this is very important in terms of if you are aware of the slot attention paper. But in our work, we can handle any number of slots, which, for example, the slot attention paper needs to know how many objects to deal with uh, at the start of the training. And once you have these object level representations, you can do deletion and insertion and create like more synthetic data. Uh, we have compared to uh, for the null view synthesis task with the pixel nerf and uh, with UARF, which is the unsupervised object radiance fields. We perform better in terms of uh, null view synthesis, especially if you look at this car right here. Uh, it is much more clear, and this is mainly because once you have the persistent grid, the 2D CNN uh, can do better in painting uh, because it has priors over the geometry and the appearance. Um, in terms of object segmentation, uh, also we uh, compare in terms of the ARI index, which is the metric used uh, for assessing similarity between clusters, and we find that we are at par with UARF. Um, one more thing that we can do uh, is we can add more views dynamically and resolve uncertainty in the target view. So for example, if you had to render this particular view, the first context view does not provide you with that information. But as soon as you get the third view, which has the background image, uh, our model synthesizes the background views perfectly. And there are a few limitations, uh, such as like we only demonstrate this on synthetic data. But I am assuming with like more fleet of autonomous vehicles, uh, we would be able to see like geotag data, and we can render ground plans for cities uh, dynamically. Uh, there's limited expressivity along the y-axis. This can be resolved using like extending this idea to triplane setup. Um, and because this is a prior-based method, we can only do disentanglement uh, in terms of uh, objects that we have seen before. And with that, thanks. OK, thank you for the talk. So the next speaker can set up your, and the, maybe one quick question. Do, do you guys have one live question? <laughs> okay. um, I, I think in this work, uh, the, the images provided are always using the same camera calibration, right? Do you think it's possible to train this method on a variety of different camera setups or like the different camera parameters in you terms of focal length or like fisheye cameras or that kind of? Yeah, sure, because it takes the intrinsics into uh, account when you are doing the unprojection as well as rendering. So as long as your data set has like multiple uh, lens parameters, it should be able to handle that. Okay. There's nothing taking a uh, pinhole into account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next talk will be from Ben Chen Liao. His talk will be about MapTR structure modeling and learning for online vectorized HD map construction. Thanks for having me. And hello, everyone. I'm Ben Chen Liao, a PhD student at Huazhong University of Science and Technology, advised by Professor Xin Gang Wang. I'm also a research intern at Horizon Robotics. Here, I'm very glad to present our work, MapTR. Because our work follows Professor Zhao's great work, HD MapNet and Vector MapNet, there will exist, it will exist some overlaps in the introduction. And uh, the high definition map, uh, the abbreviated as HD map, is an essential component in the autonomous driving. HD map comprises a set of map elements with various semantics. This information is vital to downstream applications such as planning and control. Typically, uh, typically, this information can be represented in either vectorized map or rasterized map. The rasterized map is typically in the form of dense pixels, which are hard to maintain and incur quantization error. Compared with the, the ras rasterized forms, vectorized map has high flexibility and uh, abundant in instance information, which is easy to use and highly structured. 
To construct HD map, traditional methods need to capture the point cloud beforehand and build globally consistent map using SLAM. Based on this point cloud map, immense human efforts are put into semantic and shape annotation. This offline pipeline is complicated and requires high cost. And due to the privacy and the limitation of law and regulation, it cannot cover all the driving areas. The low freshness also limits its wide application in the everyday life. In face of the above issues of rasterized map and offline pipeline, HD map um, formulate tasks to construct HD map online in vectorized forms. Constructing the HD map online means that we only use the data captured by the onboard sensor, such as surrounding cameras and LiDAR, to generate the HD map. In this situation, we will face the challenge of diverse weather conditions and heavy traffic. Constructing in vectorized forms means that we should predict each map in with various shapes and the semantics. The shapes typically consist of a polyline and a polygon. The semantics comprise the pedestrian crossing, land divider, and the road boundary. Previous methods either use segmentation-based methods, which first predict segmentation map on dense bird's eye view pixels, and then utilize time-consuming post-processing to vectorize semantic map elements, or use detection-based methods, which first predicts the envelope both of map elements, and then use autoregressive network to predict directed polyline shape. Inspired by the success and the simplicity of data in 2D object detection, we ponder whether we can design a data-like paradigm for efficient end-to-end -end vectorized HD map construction without multi-stage pipeline and time-consuming post-processing. We show that the answer is affirmative. We first visit the shape modeling of HD map. Different from the box shape modeling in 2D detection, the geometric shapes of map elements are more dynamic and challenging, consisting of open shape polylines and closed shape polygons. Previous methods built first, uh, previous methods vector map net built first end to end framework to construct vectorized HD map. But both polylines and polygons are treated as directed polylines with direction given by the annotators. But is this, is this direction correct and deterministic? To answer that question, we dive deeper into the practical scenarios. As you can see in the right figure, both endpoints of the land divider can be regarded as a start point, and the point set can be organized in the two directions. And for the polygonal pedestrian, and each point can be seen as the start point and has two opposite direction to organize the sequences. To address this issue, we propose a permutation equivalent modeling, which decoupled the shape into two parts, point set V and a group equivalent permutation gamma to cover all possible organization sequences. For polylines, gamma includes two kinds of equivalent permutations. For polygons, gamma includes two NV kinds of equivalent permutations, where NV is the number of the points. Based on the shape modeling, we can now build a transformer encoder decoder architecture to perform end to end learning. The network of a mapter takes surrounding views as input and is easy to extend to multimodality. The map encoder extracts feature from the sensor data and uh, transforms the extracted feature into unified bird's eye view representation. The map decoder is a data-like transformer decoder to decode the structure map elements from the BEV features using map queries. We design a hierarchical query mechanism to flexibly encode each map element. Specifically, we encode the instance level information into instance queries and encode the specific shape information of each map element into SharePoint queries. Self-tension in the decoder introduces inter-instance and inter-instance interaction, and the deformable cross-tension helps the decoder explore the specific local information along the geometrical shape. Based on the proposed permutation equivalent modeling, we further introduce hierarchical bipartite marching for label assignment. With the architecture detail in the last slide, Mapter parallelly enforce a fixed size set of n map elements in a single pass. We first perform instance-level marching during training. We calculate the pairwise marching cost between predictions and GT. The marching cost only considers classification and the position. The Hungarian algorithm is utilized to find the optimal instance-level assignment. Based on the instance-level assignment, we perform point-level marching to find the optimal permutation between the predicted map elements and the match GT map element using the minimum Manhattan distance. 
with the optimal instance level and the point level assignment, we can calculate the final loss consisting of three parts, classification loss, the widely used focal loss. Point to point loss supervises the position of each predicted point, and edge direction loss further com complements point supervision, enforcing the direction between the interconnected points to align with the GT to supervise geometrical shape at a higher edge level. The experiments show that the permutation equivalent modeling solves the direction ambiguity of map elements and largely boosts the performance over the previous fixed order modeling. The, sig the significant improvement in polygonal pedestrian crossing further validates the effectiveness. Mapter achieves great results in terms of accuracy, training efficiency, and inference speed. And uh, combined with la LADAR, LADAR point cloud, we can further boost the performance into uh, into higher, higher, higher results. We also applied our design choice with extensive experience in, in this slide. And uh, you, you can refer to our paper for further details. We visualize the results in video phones. The first column is the GT map. The second column is the results predicted by Mapter. These results show that the Mapter maintains stable and robust vectorized HD map construction quality in complex and various driving scenes. And we hope that Mapter can serve as a fundamental module and facilitate the development of autonomous driving. And thank you very much. Okay. Are there any questions? OK. Maybe maybe let me ask one question. One very quick question. How, how what do you think about the like formula? Because you formulate one li one line as vectorized maps. So how about the formulations like Professor Hang Zhao? They they propose semantic segmentation and uh, you 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 use the vectorized uh, formulation. What about other formulations and the future directions? What do you think about that question? The formulations of lines. Um, we, we think the formulation matters, and uh, the rasterized formulation may may have may have difficulty in to in predicting very precise pre precise and uh, very de dense dense length length structure such such as the the center lines in the in the uh, in in cross and which have a lot of a lot of very close uh, lengths that the cement the rasterized formulation will will uh, will have difficulty in, in distinguishing with each other. So we think the vectorized map the vectorized form uh, formulated by the vector magnet uh, will have high flexibility and high um, precise in in these situations. And uh, yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the talk from Ben Chen Diao. Yeah. Okay. Next, we will have presenters on Zoom, please. Yeah. Maybe it, it will be Peng Hao Wu from UCSD. He will present policy pre-training for autonomous driving via self-supervised geometric modeling. OK, we can see you maybe and the slide. Uh. Can you see the slides now? Uh, maybe wait wait a moment. Uh, can can you hear me? Please stop. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Peng Hao Wu, a master student at UCSD. Today, I'm going to present our work, PBGO, Policy Pre-Training for Autonomous Driving via Self-Supervised Geometric Modeling. This work is done during my internship at Shanghai AI Lab and collaborated with Shanghai Xiaotong University. End-to-end -end driving or visual model driving policy learning means that the model learns to directly map the road sensor inputs to final control or planning signals in an end-to-end -end approach. Therefore, the visual model needs to extract the driving policy-related information, such as critical vehicles and traffic lights in the input, which makes this task require large amount of training samples. A natural solution is to pre-train the visual encoder of the model. 
However, different from common computer vision tasks or robotics tasks, the unique characteristics of visual motor driving policy learning make the common pre-training methods not suitable. Specifically, the visual motor driving task has highly dynamic and variant input. It lacks view and translation invariance, and the input really contains a lot of irrelevant information for decision making. For example, many irrelevant objects like buildings and vehicles on the sides usually take up a large portion of the visual input, while signals which are deterministic to our driving, like traffic lights, only occupies a small region. And our model should also be robust to the various light or weather conditions in the input. Therefore, we need to design a special pre-training method customized for visual motor driving policy learning. Through pre-training with large-scale unlabeled data, the visual encoder is then able to extract useful information for driving, and it can then be better adapt to downstream tasks with only small amount of labeled data. Previous work pre-trained the visual encoder in a contrastive learning framework with pseudo-steering angle labels. However, pseudo-labeling approaches suffer from noisy predictions from poorly calibrated models. And this is true especially when there exists distinct domain gap between the label data set and the large-scale unlabeled noisy data. Therefore, we aim to design a more direct and intuitive learning objective without pseudo-label or extra data sets. Based on this consideration and the uniqueness of visual motor driving, we propose our pre-training pipeline, a self-supervised two-stage pre-training pipeline with unlabeled driving video by predicting eco motions our pipeline consists of two stages. In stage one, given two consecutive visual input frames, we pass them to a post net and a depth net. The depth net needs to predict the depth map for current time step t. And the post net takes two frames as input to predict the camera intrinsics and the eagle motion from t to t plus one. The post net takes two consecutive frames as input and infers the eagle motion by comparing these two frames. In this case, it predicts that the eagle vehicle stopped since the consecutive frames barely changed. And getting the predicted eagle motion, camera intrinsics, and the depth map, these models are supervised by photometric reconstruction as commonly used in self-supervised depth estimation frameworks. In stage two, we focus on the visual encoder, which needs to be pre-trained. Now, the visual encoder only takes single frame at time step t as input, and it also needs to predict the future eco motion from t to t plus one. Therefore, it has to learn useful information in the current frame in order to correctly infer the motion. And in this example, it predicts the ego to stop since the car is ahead. And we use the depth and the intrinsic obtained in stage one to form the photometric reconstruction. And through predicting the future ego motion based on single frame input, the visual encoder is forced to learn the driving policy contained in the large scale driving video. And after these two stages pre training, the visual encoder can then be used as initial weights for downstream visual motor driving tasks. It enables training downstream visual motor models with very lim limited label data. We have compared our methods with other pre-training baselines on a set of downstream visual motor driving tasks. We conduct three imitation learning based driving tasks, including navigation, navigation dynamic, and leaderboard count five long, and one reinforcement learning task with closed loop evaluation in Carla plus an open loop planning task on the real world data set new sense. The visual motor driving model in all these tasks is a simple end-to-end -end model consists of a visual encoder plus a policy hat. 
for the navigation and navigation dynamic tasks. The driving model needs to control the ego vehicle to complete predefined routes without any collisions. We vary the size of the training samples from 4,000 to 40,000. And in the case of the particularly small size of training samples, our models still demonstrate competitive performance over others. And the leaderboard Town 5 long task is closer to real world driving with various challenging driving scenarios and different types of infractions or violations are evaluated. The model pre-trained with our method achieves the highest driving score and infraction score, showing better ability to avoid collisions and enhance safety. And our method shows consistent improvement over others in the reinforcement learning setting with both frozen visual encoder and fine-tuned visual encoder. Besides closed-loop evaluation in color, for the trajectory planning task on the real-world dataset NewSense, our method also achieved the best L2 error and the lowest collision rate. Besides, our pre-trained depth net and post net in stage one could also bring performance gain to the depth and odometry estimation task as the initial weights. And we also show the activation maps of the representation learned through different pre-trained methods. We can see that our methods mainly focus on the front lane and safety critical elements like front vehicle near the eco vehicle and traffic lights, which are all important for planning, while others may mistakenly focus on salient objects, which are irrelevant to driving. And that's all for my presentation. Thanks for listening. And you can check our paper on GitHub code for more information. Thank you. Thanks, Peng Hao. So do you have any live questions? <laughs> OK, so we, we are running out of time. So please contact Peng Hao if you have any further questions. Maybe we can just give to the next presenter. So the next presenter will be Zhi Yuan Cheng. He will present adversarial training of self-supervised monocular death explanation against the physical world attacks. Hello, Zhi Yuan. I think you can. Hello, you hello. Can. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I will share my screen first. Hi, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, you can start, I think. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Zhi Yuan Cheng and I'm a PhD student at Purdue University. My advisor is uh, Professor Xiang Yu Zhang and I'm pleased to present our paper titled Adversal Training of Self-Supervised Monocular Depth Estimation Against Physical World Attacks. This research is a joint work by authors from Purdue University and Rochester Institute of Technology. First, uh, let me give an, uh, give, uh, provide an overview of monocular depth estimation. Uh, this technique predicts the per pixel distance between an object and the camera using single RGB image input, enabling the projection from a 2D image to a 3D space. Monocular depth estimation has numerous applications, including visual slam, 3D object detection, visual odometry, and autonomous training. It is worth to know that Tesla has integrated uh, monocular depth estimation into their autonomous driving systems. They have been using a self-supervised method to train the uh, MDE model and improve the performance using transformers and multi-camera videos. Toyota is also actively investigating this technique in autonomous driving. They create studio LiDAR using multiple frames of visual depths from surrounding cameras. Given the relevant applications and security implications of monitor depth estimation, the DNA model for this technique have been targeted by both digital space and physical world attacks. Just digital space attacks involve adversarial perturbations that are imperceptible to humans on the whole image, which can cause objects to disappear or appear closer or further away. 
However, these, te these attacks are not practical in the physical world because it is not easy to control each pixel value precisely. Physical world attacks typically utilize adversarial patches. Attackers can print these patches and attach them to target objects, compromising depth estimation and making objects appear closer or further away. Recent physical world adversarial attacks have prioritized the staleness of these patches. In our previous work that are published in ECCV, we focused on stealthy object oriented, uh, physical object oriented MD attack. We, pr we proposed to enhance the staleness of adversarial patches by improving the naturalness of the patch's appearance and minimize the patch size. We employed a style transfer technique to camouflage the adversarial pattern into rusty or dirty styles, making it look more natural. Additionally, we sought to minimize the patch size by optimizing the patch region and adversarial pattern simultaneously. We introduced a differentiable representation of the patch region, encoding the four border parameters into patch mask values. This method allowed us to generate a small but effective patch on the most sensitive region of the target object. Given the security critical nature of monocular depth estimation and the prevalence of adversarial attacks, particularly the physical world attacks, it is crucial to develop effective uh, defense, defenses against them. In this paper, we propose a solution to harden monocular depth estimation models against physical world attacks using self-supervised adversarial training, eliminating the need for ground truth depth labels. Our approach leverages the reconstruction consistency between different VO images for self-supervised self training. Now let me ex explain the concepts behind our proposed solution. To start with, a board A printed with a 2D image of a 3D object is placed at a fixed location. Then we use two cameras, CT and CS, to provide a stereo view of the board. Note that when two cameras are not available, one can use two close-by frames in a video stream to form the two views as well. During adversarial training, camera CT and CS take pictures of the 2D image producing a target view and a source view. The object in the target view is then perturbed to deceive the subject molecular depth estimation model. Because of the adversarial perturbation, the 3D, pro 3D object projected from the incorrect depth estimation locates at a different place from the image board with distance. This map back process requires the transformation matrix of the two camera poses, which can be estimated from an additional post network. A perfect depth estimation and 3D projection would make the reconstructed target view identical to the original one, but wrong depth estimation would cause distortions in the reconstruction. Hence, we can update the depth estimation model to minimize the reconstruction error and encourage a correct depth estimation disregarding the adversarial perturbations. Implementing this scenario physically is time consuming. To minimize the physical world cost, we innovatively synthesize objects onto background view images following physical world constraints and directly add adversarial noise to such object images for adversarial training. Here are some examples of the synthesized images from two stereo views. Different objects are placed at various distances, and our image synthesis technique is, de is demonstrated to be precise and realistic. Specifically, uh, during the VO synthesis, we first define the position and the rotation of the target object with a distance and a viewing angle relative to the target camera's coordinate system. Then we transform pixels from 2D uh, object image to the 3D coordinates in the physical world based on the defined distance and viewing angle. At last, we project the 3D coordinates to pixels of the target and source view images using camera intrinsics and the transformation matrix of the camera poses, leading to physically realistic image synthesis. During synthesis, we mimic the condition of physical world attacks using L0 norm bounded perturbations. L0 norm restricts the total number of perturbed pixels uh, instead of the magnitude of perturbations in traditional L infinite norm which aligns with patch attacks more closely because perturbations in the patched area are usually unbounded. Examples on this slide compare the perturbations 
uh, bounded by L0 norm and the L infinite norm. We employ a differentiable algorithm in generating the L0 norm bounded perturbations. Specifically, we generate the perturbations by decomposing the perturbations into positive and negative components. And we use the long tail effects of tension edge function in, a, in an additional normalization term to encourage either zero perturbations or arbitrarily large perturbations. Also, we employ uh, estimation of transformation and randomize the camera and object settings during synthesis to improve physical world robustness. Our training pipeline consists of two trainable networks, the monocular depth estimation network and, the, and a camera post prediction network. The post network predicts the transformation matrix of the two camera poses from two view images. From left to right, the pipeline takes the object image and synthesizes to the source and the target view images. The object on the target view is perturbed to generate a versatile target view, and it is then fed to the MDE network, acquiring depth estimation. The depth information, the transformation matrix of two camera poses and the source view images are used to derive the reconstructed packet view. Both models are then, up, uh, are then trained to minimize the reconstruction error and disregard adverse perturbations. Our model hardening technique is supported by both results from the synthesized images and real world results. The adverse perturbations now has nearly no attacking effect on the hardened MD model and the depth estimation error caused by the, caused by the physical world patch is also substantially mitigated. Our method also demonstrates superior defense performance against various attacking techniques, surpassing a supervised and a contrastive learning based adverse training baseline. For further evaluation results, uh, please refer to our paper. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Okay, thank you, Ju, and we 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 are we are we are running out of time. So please contact Ju and for further questions. Okay. So okay, so we have another contribution for this law, like uh, it is a blog contribution. So it's from Peter Mortimer. The, the blog name is how do vision transformers see death in single images? He will record. We will play the pre-record video, and uh, he will attend the Q and A session. Hello, my name is Peter Mortimer, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute for Autonomous Systems Technology at the University of the Bundeswehr Munich. Today I'll present my work on how do vision transformers see depth in single images. I submitted this work as part of the research insight track of the workshop, meaning that I'm not submitting an original contribution, but revisiting the work from Van Dyck and de Kroon from 2019. I've extended their experiments to not only analyze monodepth, but a more novel transformer-based approach for the same experiments. The experiments and the visualizations lend themselves well for an interactive format. I therefore decided to submit this work as a blog post so that the interactive visualizations could be embedded within the online article. The original work from Vidaik and de Kroon analyzed the performance of monodepth for monocular depth estimation. As a quick recap, that's the computer vision task of estimating the distance of each pixel in a camera in reference to its 3D position in the scene. Their analysis focused on constructing its experiments to gain insights about the visual cues that monodepth uses to solve this inverse problem. They used the semantically segmented image data available in the Kitty dataset in clever ways to construct specific scenarios that reveal tendencies hidden behind the blackboard model that most of deep neural networks resemble. Monolith used a similar network architecture to the popular DiskNet that resembles a fully convolutional neural network with long range links between the encoder and the decoder part of the network. In this work, we also run their original experiments on the novel transformer based architecture called DPT. Transformers originated as building blocks for natural language processing tasks, but recent work has shown that representing an image as a bag of words 
where the pixel patches represent words up is an effective way to create neural networks with the global receptive field at every stage of the encoding process. The image patches are taken from the output feature map of a ResNet50 feature extractor of the original color image, meaning that we're actually looking at a hybrid approach with DPT when comparing it to the fully convolutional monodepth. The two experiments I'll show in this talk look at three visual cues in total that to an extent also resemble visual cues that are used by the human vision system to estimate depth without stereo input. The first experiment analyzes the importance of the object's vertical position in the camera image as a visual cue and the importance of the scale of a detected object in the image. Under the assumption of a flat ground and a good estimate of the camera's height above the ground, we can use the vertical position of an object's ground contact point to estimate the object's distance. The lower the object appears in the camera image, the closer it is to the ground surface that is closer to us. The most distant ground contact point vanishes in the horizon line of the camera image. Assuming a pinhole camera model, we can project the detected ground contact point from the image sensor to our estimate of where the ground plane lies under our camera. The second visual cue related to the apparent size of the object in the image requires a good estimate of the real world height of the object. The smaller the object appears in the image, the further away it is from our camera. These model assumptions aren't explicitly embedded in the training of either of the two networks we're looking at, but are rather used to create experiments that test these specific visual cues. Based on these observations and on how to mathematically describe the visual cues, the original authors augmented images in the Kitty dataset the following way. They placed a new obstacle in the free space of the scene and increased its relative distance to the camera. The natural effect involves a change in the object's position and scale in the camera image. But to observe how much each visual cue affects the network's depth estimate of the object, two additional sequences are con constructed where only the position and only the scale of the object is changed within a sequence of images. We get the following statistics when comparing a sufficient number of sequences. The left plot comes from the depth estimates of a novel transformer-based DPT network and the right from the original monodepth network. Here we're comparing the estimated depth of the network's output compared to the true relative distance and how we shifted the object based on our model. We observe a smaller variance in DPT's depth prediction. Keeping the position fixed and only observing a change in scale for an object leads to DPT consistently underestimating the distance of the object, which is visible here in the yellow plot. The change in scale does matter to a degree for DPT since only changing the object's position also leads to an underestimate compared, as you can see here in red, compared to the ground truth or the perfect estimate of the gray, um, gray dashed line. For monodub, we can see a heavy reliance on the object's position for its depth estimate, where the red plot is very similar to the blue plot, where the blue plot resembles the natural observation of where the object's scale and position change with the increased depth. In the blog post, the reader can hover over each line to get a more comprehensive description of this rather dense plot. The third visual cue we will only go over briefly. The dark drop shadow of a standing object on the ground surface is a strong visual cue. When we place our arbitrary object into the free space of a scene, we can observe a difference in monodep's obstacle recognition perform performance if the drop shadow is added to the object or not. Here again, we have an interactive visualization where we can zoom in into the prediction of monodep and take a closer look of the prediction around the arbitrary object we placed in the free space of the scene. If we pan down here, we see that a larger part of the bottom half of the object is detected. In both scenarios, even with the drop shadow, the top half of the arbitrary object is not detected by monodepth. On the right column, we added DPT's pixel-wise depth prediction and observe a reliable detection of the obstacle regardless of the drop shadows present or not. Here again, we can zoom in and compare directly the 
prediction performance of DPT compared to Monotype. This concludes the two experiments I wanted to present. Here in the conclusions, I would like to mention the caveat that DPT has been trained on a much larger training set than Monodep, which could explain the robust performance for arbitrary objects, which we saw in the second experiment. DPT was fine-tuned to KD data for benchmarking purposes. This makes the comparison in that aspect a bit unfair. Please check out the blog post if you're interested in this work. Thank you for your attention. If the workshop schedule allows, then I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, I think Peter is online on Zoom, and do you have any questions for him? Okay, maybe, can Peter see me? Peter, can you framework for autonomous driving in multi-land roundabout? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please share a slide and you can start. Okay, can, can you see my screen? Okay, okay, so I'm start. Hello everyone, I'm Yao Mu, a PhD student at the University of Hong Kong. I'm glad to present our work neural MPC-based decision-making framework for autonomous driving in multi-line roundabout. This work is a joint collaboration between the University of Hong Kong and Tsinghua University. So the representation consists of four parts. I will begin with the introduction. Nowadays, we are chasing high-level autonomous driving on complex urban roads, given that the autonomous driving vehicles are required to face diverse scenarios and interact with different traffic participations with the limited computational resources. The development of decision and control is of significant importance for the intelligence of autonomous driving. We propose a novel decision-making control framework to de deal with the complex traffic scenarios with sufficient flexible and low online computing cost. Next, I will introduce our method. To handle the complex scenario, we split the whole decision-making problem into separated constrained MPC problems. We first generate several candidate stat statistic passes based on the road structure and topology. For example, in multi-line large uh, roundabout, the statistic path can be generated as shown in this figure. We, for, we formulate the decision-making problem as a series of parallel statistic path tracking problem subject to the safety constraint with dynamic surrounding vehicles. Then the statistic path with the minimal tracking cost is selected as the uh, target reference path as it's indicates better driving safety and efficiency. The whole state transition dynamics model used to predict future states con contains the vehicle model of the ego car and a recurrent neural network for the surrounding vehicle prediction and captures a characteristic of the current traffic flow. The whole framework is divided into in two phases, model-based offline training and online application. In the offline training phases, the decision-making problem is formulated as a, general, a generalized constrained optimization problem that involves parallel statistic path tracking tasks under the safety constraint. A neural model predict control solver is used to solve the optimization problem, which consists of a state transition model, an actor network, and an, and a critic network. The state transition model learns the state transition and predicts the future states according to the current actor's behavior. And the actor is then optimized through the SGD by minimizing the cost of 
each constraint tracking problem. The critic learns the optimal cost of each constraint tracking task. In, then in the online application phases, the critic is used to select the optimal target statistic path without any model rollout. Therefore, it can save the online computational resources. While the actor outputs the corresponding actions, this seems as the integration of the actor and critic loads for real-time decision-making while ensuring the safety constraints are satisfied. Next, I will show you the experimental results. The proposed method is tested on a multi-line roundabout simulator based on a real robot in Beijing, China and shows improved the inf uh, and shows the improved performance on driving safety and efficiency over several baseline algorithms under the various traffic densities. Here are some demos. It can automatically change lines when there is a traffic jam ahead. Okay, and there are more more demos to demonstrate the intelligence of our proposed decision making framework. The multi line roundabout scenario contains many sub scenarios, such as multi uh, multi line driving and uh, line changing, and the. Uh, the ego car selects the optimal uh, line to 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 following and avoid the uh, avoid collision with the other surrounding vehicles. Okay, finally the conclusion. Neural MPC framework has several advantages compared to conventional decision making method. The first one, it is a unified framework through statistic path planning and dynamic optimal tracking. Neural MPC formulates the decision making and control problem into a unified optimization selection scheme, which is a, a, applicable. Uh, which can be applied to various driving situations. The second one is, is accu uh, accurate prediction of surrounding tra traffic classifications behavior. And the next one is the uh, improved computational efficiency. The MPC uses two neural networks for knowledge uh, uh, to to select the target line and output the corresponding action in real time. And this can lead more practical and feasible implementation of the framework in autonomous driving systems. Okay, that's all. Thanks for your attention. Okay, do you have any question? Okay, well, I have one question. So, uh, you you choose the roundabouts to test your algorithms. So, what's the difference between roundabouts and some intersections? I mean, like like the cross intersections. So, can your algorithms generalize to other intersections? Yes, uh, so we we choose roundabouts. Uh, uh, we we uh, actually is we we choose. Uh, large multi-line roundabout. It contains many sub-scenarios, such as um, multi-line, like the like the highway, and uh, uh, in the when the vehicle is entering the roundabout and existing the roundabout, uh, it the, the, the scenario is also like a, a like a is 
uh, insertion that it needs to interact with the surrounding we uh, surrounding vehicles. Therefore, is an another characteristic of roundabout is that it has four it it has four it, um, entering point and exit point. There and our you don't know the surrounding vehicles aims to exist in uh, in. in which uh, you don't know the, the surrounding vehicle m to exist in which point. Therefore, the uh, its behavior is hard to predict. And uh, I think it's maybe more, um, more difficult scenario to test the performance of decision-making framework. That makes sense. OK, thank you. So no more questions. So that's all for morning's contribution session. And we will have a coffee break until 11.30. And we will have two invited speakers from Deng Xindai from ETH Zurich.